Hey guys, welcome to our last GMI of the season. And we decided to change it up a little bit with our anchors this morning. Yeah, that's right. Dan and I are very familiar faces behind the scenes, behind the camera. Maybe not so much, you know, on camera, definitely not anchoring. Dan Girardi is our director of Good Morning Atlanta. How you doing? Doing <laughs> great. And Maddie Rice is our executive producer. Thank you. Go. That's right. <laughs> Cool. Well, we are so excited uh, to be with you guys this morning. You know, on today's show, we continue our series on our COVID-19 Illinois stories. Blake Landa introduces us to the difficulties of teaching physical education over the internet. Then, where's Connor Seco? And Maddie, I heard he's taking a trip to the zoo. And this being our last show, we have some thank yous, some goodbyes, and some introductions for you. All that and more, so let's make it a good morning, Illini. First off, today we check back in with our correspondent, Kenya Williams. We've seen her go about her day as an essential worker, but now she gives us an inside look at the life of stay-at-home workers. After the stay-at-home order was issued on March 21st, a lot of workers had to adjust not only to bringing their work into their homes, but not being able to transport at all. I like the hustle and bustle of going, you know, to my job. I love the um, riding the train, I love the smell of the city, the excitement of the city. You know, working from home was never a good choice for me. I don't like kind of being confined to just the, the house. I, I love the office. With being at home also comes a lot of distractions. Being at work is here at home. I don't want to get distracted by a lot of other things. So I kind of tune myself out. But, you know, you do have your distractions because sometimes you get so comfortable being at home because you are comfortable. Even though during this time there are individuals first time working at home, others on the other hand are already used to it. Yolanda Williams, a disclosure specialist for Internal Revenue Service, was already put on flexi place before quarantine. I worked um, three days in the office and then one day at home. So now I'm working every day at home. But now being with your significant other 24-7 and having to work while they are in the house is an adjustment. Because when I'm working at home, I'm not used to him being here. I'm not used to him walking in on me while I'm working and the conversation, um, talking back and forth with him. And on the other hand... Well, that's my co-worker now. We call each other co-workers now. So we got <laughs> husband and wife doing work hours. So that's my co-worker. So. It is not known when employees will be able to officially start going back into work. But for now, employees have to try their best to continue to just at home. Uh, wow, I thought that was a really great insight. What did you think, Dan? Yeah, no, it was really cool to get that perspective. U of I student Gretchen Macklin knows a little something about stay-at-home workers herself. Next up, we see how her father, a tax accountant, is keeping busy and able to continue to help people out even during a pandemic. My dad, like many others, is learning what it's like to work from home. He typically meets with farm operators in person to prepare their financial statements and taxes. And even though the tax deadline has been extended, restrictions on in-person meetings can be challenging to work around. There's still some people that really want to meet and you can't hardly get around it. I mean, if they're new to something, like I've got some people that have hired employees for the first time, there's a lot of forms and stuff to fill out. It's kind of hard to, to get through all that over the phone. Although he is concerned about our economy and the people affected by the virus, he does think there are positive side effects to the quarantine. He's especially excited about all the good food mom has been fixing. I think people are showing a lot of kindness and caring and I think, you know, they're getting to spend time with their families and, you know, you hear about people playing cards and board games and stuff like that. I just, I think that's, that's good. Well, Maddie, Gretchen uh, gave us some cool insight there. It was awesome to see her dad, you know, still able to help people out even during these crazy times. Yeah, definitely really nice to see that he's still able to help out, especially when finances are such a 
very difficult thing to be handling right now, especially in the pandemic. So yeah, it's great to see that he can still help out even from home. And it would seem that quarantine is something that everyone all across the globe is experiencing. And we're very lucky to have a student uh, all the way down in Mexico to lend her unique experience on how she and her family are dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. In November of 2019, I bought my spring break flight ticket to Mexico. Excited for the annual fair in my mom's hometown and the family reunion that falls on the same week, I was determined nothing would get in my way, naively not even a global pandemic. Staying to quarantine in Mexico was no question. This is home, they are home. Fortunately, my mom and dad feel the same way. While I'm locked away in my room doing schoolwork, they fill their time with preparing our meals, buying groceries, making phone calls, and taking care of mains around the house. They take pride in the healthy food they've been able to provide us during this time. I'm thankful for the opportunity to spend this long of a time with my parents in their home country. Well, Maddie, that was definitely a different perspective to get a look inside another country during this pandemic. And it really just gives you a sense that this is something that truly affects everybody around the world. Yeah, I definitely agree. We're very fortunate to be able to even have access to stories like that. But as, as weird as it may sound, I really do feel like stories like that that show that everyone is going through this uh, makes you just feel like we're on this together. And it, it very like unifying feeling that the whole world is going through this situation right now. Um, but moving on, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to get a sneak peek into the future here where we finally find out who are going to be the GMI producers for next season. After that, we're going to catch up with GMI's very own Blake Landa and see exactly how someone teaches PE through a webcam. Stick around. Yellow. I'm getting a crew together and I need producers. You in? Yeah, I'm in. One hundred percent, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Um, one thing though, I, I'm I'm already here. Now we just need anchors. But who? We need TV experts. I know just who to call. Hello. Hello. What are you doing this fall? Anchoring. Good answer. What's in it for me? An opportunity. Opportunity to what? to tell stories that matter. And if I say no? You won't. How do you know? Because you picked up the phone. Good, Good morning, morning Lana. Lana. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks so much for sticking with us. We've got a lot more show for you this morning. Next, we check in with GMI's Blake Landa, who's going to show us how a PE teacher is using a webcam to teach his students during quarantine. The coronavirus has changed lives all around the world, but it has been specifically hard for physical education teachers. These teachers rely on being able to instruct students in person, but with schools being closed, it's very difficult for them to perform their jobs. It has changed high school curriculums as well as primary school. So we've had to modify it quite a bit, actually, so we have to make it very student-driven. It's challenging in a sense because... Uh, we're giving them this log, we're giving them directions, uh, you know, workouts of the day and all these different sorts of things, but I, we are not seeing them do it. It's, it's, it's imp kind of impossible to do it all in classes, like live sessions and these videos and whatnot, because they have all these other different obligations in classes. So it's just, you know, kind of hoping that they are following it and staying active for those 20, 30 minutes a day, if, if not more. And, you know, that's what we are saying that's not out of reach at all. It might be a little bit easier for high school students who have access to the more technological advances compared to elementary students. A lot of families don't have the technology required to do e-learning. So our, our school and our whole district actually haven't been able to do e-learning. We do something called remote learning, which it's a little more work. We have to send out packets every week to uh, all the families, and 
in those packets is ever is everything that would be in um, online. I miss the students. I miss getting hugs every morning from the kids and and seeing their faces and, the, and smiles on their face and having them tell me how much they love PE. This is a new experience for us all, but I still think that the world will continue to turn and hopefully schools will be back in session. I've learned how much I really do love my job and I just feel really fortunate and um, I just, I, I can't wait to go back and I'm never gonna take for granted uh, getting to go into school every day and uh, having an impact and seeing, seeing me make a positive impact on, on all these kids. And while PD might be worried about their students keeping up, they may rest a little easier after seeing just how dedicated one high school student is about staying in shape. Let's check it out. Grace Hardy is a senior at St. Lawrence High School in Chicago. This time should be spent getting ready for prom and graduation. So you could say attending Zoom class in pajamas isn't exactly how she pictured her final semester. But Hardy says she isn't using the online format as an excuse to relax on her studies. With the online classes, it's really easy to fall behind. Especially with seniors, it's really crucial for them to stay on top of things because come fall, we're starting college and you can't just fall behind. Hardy's motivation doesn't stop at academics. She recently signed to run track at North Central College and was a state finalist in the 400 meter dash last spring. She says she's using this time to get ahead of her competition. Given the circumstances, knowing that a lot of girls aren't doing what they're supposed to be right now, I know I'll come out on top because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'll get that spot over them. Hardy's hoping hard work in quarantine will help her start college off on the right foot. In Chicago, I'm Dan Hardy, UI7. Sticking with athletics, Mariah Guzman was able to chat with Bleacher Report writer Marina Fader. She recently published an article about the WNBA number one overall draft pick, Sabrina Ionescu. They chatted about getting to know your subject more and intricacies of writing sports journalism. Um, specifically with the story that I read um, that introduced me to your work was the A Season of Loss, by what, which was the profile about uh, Sabrina Ionescu. And so I really thought it was interesting how you even threw in how she uses uh, sacks of potatoes and onions for weights and how there's a lemon tree in her backyard. When I read your story, I've just never really read something like that with that detail. So I was really interested to see how you navigate that sort of detail in sports writing because that's not common specifically in sports writing. A lot of athletes don't think in terms of anecdotes. So if you ask the question, like, how are you staying in shape? How are you working out right now? She literally said, oh, you know, I'm just doing some workouts in my backyard. Now, bad reporter accepts that and is like, oh, cool, backyard workouts. Good reporter is like, can you give me some examples? Like, what does the backyard look like? How much space do you have? What types of drills are you doing? But normal yeah. people don't think like that. So you have to like get it out of them and just ask for specific specifics. It was in the beginning of the article when you said that she wakes up and hears Gigi Bryan's um, laugh in her mm -hmm. dreams. That's kind of hard to talk about. How did you go around that subject with still being sensitive? about it. Once I started getting into that, um, I was like, I said something like, um, you know, I know grief pops up in and out. It's not necessarily like um, in logical order. How does it come up for you? And she's like, you know, sometimes I have a lot of dreams about Gigi and I'm like, I know it's really personal, but can you share a recent dream that you had? So it's the way that you couch the questions. It's like, I know this is difficult. I know this is personal. I know you don't want to talk about this, but I'm wondering if you can share a recent dream. How do you develop that connection to get the details and to get the work that you want? You know, everyone is a stranger until they're not. So for every story, you, you go in cold and you don't know these people. But if you spend an hour with them, and an hour with this person and an hour with all the people, you start to form something that shows that you sort of have a sense of what this person's like. And that comes from research and reporting and talking with people to find out those things. So when you approach athletes with something different, something deeper than like, oh, you know, are you sad? It, you just, you're gonna get a deeper answer when you have a deeper question. 
And no. so you've been in this business for a while. So right now you're with Bleach Report, but you've done stuff for Sports Illustrated, for ESPN. Um, how was sports writing always the intention or did that kind of fall into your lap at some point? First, I wanted to be an actual basketball player. Like that's how this started for me. Um, so I played all my life. I played my first year in college and I knew bas I really hated the first school that I went to, Lewis and Clark College. And so I ended up transferring to Occidental College and I knew that I still wanted to be in basketball, but I had this huge passion for writing. And so I just thought like, oh, let me become a sports writer, you know, combine the two. But the more that I did this, the more I realized it wasn't necessarily about the sports anymore. Like I like to think that I write about people that happen to play sports and so you know I always say if you can write about people and you can write you can write about anything I did all sports even though basketball was my preference and I didn't know like all these random football things but I covered so much football because it was players did you and ever feel timid in a way or like you weren't going to be good enough just because you were a woman who wanted to write about sports I went through a lot with that where people doubted me and underestimated me and didn't think I knew anything about stuff or treated me badly or, you know, what have you. So I still go through that. I've been through that, but I think, you know, there comes a point where you're like, do I want to do this or not? And it's really, it's down to like that internal voice inside you. That's like, am I going to push past fear? Am I going to do this? And the more you, I think the more you do that, the the longer of a career you will have. Um, I'm really young, so I'm not an authority on this subject, but I do think like, yeah, up to this point, I have pushed past a lot of fear. That's what makes these athletes interesting is it's not just you that's nervous, it's them. <laughs> you know, when, when you're writing about these multimillionaire guys who pour their heart out to you and talk about feeling insecure or upset or depressed, you just start to look at humanity a lot different. It's just like, Okay, so we all struggle. And that's, and that's why I think features are so interesting and I would encourage you to go into it because, you know, the common humanity, like that's why we wanna read stories, that's why we wanna watch movies. And so however you can make an athlete seem relatable or human, the more it's gonna connect with your audience. You know, I, I truly think a whole lot more people care about that than they do a trick play. Well, it's so good to see everyone staying dedicated and determined in the sports world, even without a lot of major events going on. And I know I can't wait to see how awesome ISN is going to be next semester with the actual games to come. You know, fingers crossed that we get sports back soon. It'll just be such a boost for everybody. Uh, until then, though, let's send it over to GMI weatherman Max Claypool for a look at our weather. Hey guys, Max Lickborough from US7 Weather with this week's forecast. We've had a really nice couple of days weather-wise, uh, as you have probably noticed, and today is going to be no different. High of 68 degrees under partly cloudy skies with a low of 52 tonight. So today, a really, really nice day to get outside. And then tomorrow, warming up even further, high of 78, and we may even see 80 uh, under partly cloudy skies. Uh, before possibly some rain and thunderstorms roll in Saturday night. So uh, Saturday, if you're trying to get out of the house, go shopping, walk the dog, do whatever. Dur the, your best chance is probably going to be during the day before those storms roll in uh, Saturday night. And then Sunday, high of 71 degrees uh, and a low of 49. Uh, unfortunately, though, we're going to see some rain Sunday, it looks like, probably throughout the day and then continuing into the night. Uh, so so uh, Friday and Saturday, definitely your two nicest days of the weekend before the rain rolls in Sunday. So I'll be back with next week's forecast, but until then, for US 7 weather, I'm Max Claypool. Thanks, Max. Hey guys, producer Liam Dwyer here. There's no Liam Goes to the Movies this week, and I'm not technically supposed to be in this episode, so don't tell Maddie or Dan, but I couldn't leave without saying thank you to everyone who made this experience worth it for me. For our instructor, Ken Erty, and our executive producers, Maddie Rice, and my fellow producers, Connor and Tim, who helped me every step of the way. They have made this journey so much easier. And of course, for our contributors, our anchors, and our audience. You guys are why I do this, so thank you. And finally, I have to say thank you to Max Claypool, who just gave us an amazing weather segment. I cannot wait to watch your journey. Up next, we have this piece by Jose 
it's about mental health. He got to sit down with the lieutenant governor. How insane is that? Check it out. And if I don't get to see you guys again, I just wanted to say one last time. Good morning, Illini. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll throughout the world and our mental health is not an exception. So I think all of it relates to mental health, that we have to recognize that it's taking a toll on everyone. And uh, as much as we want everyone to be physically safe and healthy, we also have to recognize that there is trauma that's happening as a result of this pandemic. Quarantine has proven to be difficult over time as friends and family face trouble being locked in at home for such a long time. We know in talking with experts that we have seen a rise in a number of areas, including, for example, domestic violence cases. We know that there are people who, you know, now that we have are under a stay at home order from the governor, that there are many people who may not, for example, feel safe at home. Others are also taking a toll on their mental health, particularly nurses. Mavic Madrinka is a nurse at Christ Advocate Hospital in Oakland, Illinois. She has seen firsthand how bad the situation has become. Normally we're really busy, but right now we're extremely busy. <laughs> In less than a week, an already stressful job became a nightmare. A nightmare that brought along even more than the average person could handle. Nobody's helping you. The workload is hard because it's only the nurse inside the room. I'm the uh, cleaner. I'm the CNA, I'm the nurse, I'm the, ther I'm the respiratory therapist. Putting so much on a person takes its toll. And unfortunately for Mavic, some of the situations she has faced have proven to be the most taxing. Normally, you know, when the patient is dying, there's a lot of family members, you know, to be with them. But this time, they die alone, which is, I think, the saddest part of this whole thing. And that really messed up like with a lot of my you know emotions you know sometimes i would cry i think the first time the first day i work in the COVID, i went home and i was crying <laughs> but that doesn't mean that nothing's being done to cope during this situation lieutenant governor stratton has implemented a service that nurses like mavic and other illinoisans can use to get some help in the meantime while we wait for everything to return to normal it's called call for calm and if you text talk T-A-L-K or hablar, H-A-B-L-A-R uh, for Spanish, um, you can talk to or get uh, connected to a mental health professional for free. You text, text TALK or hablar to 552020 and for free you can get connected to a mental health professional. Call for Calm is available now for anyone to use. However, Illinoisans can expect more to come as time passes particularly for parents and their children. Um, but also talk to our children very clearly and directly in ways that they understand, in ways that are age appropriate about how we're feeling about it, but to also make sure they're able to express their own thoughts. In terms of next year, I think that that'll be something that we'll have to have conversations about as we continue the budget negotiations that, to, to think about next year's budget. But as we wait for more help to arrive as things return to normal, we also need to try to do our best and do our part. I think wash your hands all the time. In Bridgeview, I'm Jose Speda. Good morning, Lana. I know it can be hard to say goodbye to our beloved seniors that are leaving, especially myself. That's really all that I, you know, am concerned about. I know that's really the only person that's going to be missed. Uh, goodbyes are hard, but don't worry, we've got just the thing to wipe away those tears. This week, Connor Seco got the chance to talk to one of the curators over at the Brookfield Zoo. So let's check out what he has to say and look at the adorable animals that the zoo was nice enough to share with us. Good morning, Illini. Just because we have to stay home doesn't mean we have to stop learning about the world around us. The Brookfield Zoo is continuing that mission, but like many businesses across the country, its doors have been closed to the public since Governor Pritzker announced the statewide stay-at-home order on March 21st. Despite this, the work that they do hasn't stopped. Joining us today is Tim Sullivan, Curator of Behavioral Husbandry at the Brookfield Zoo. Thanks for joining us, Tim. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So before we start, tell me, what do you enjoy most about doing your job? 
I walk into the zoo every day and pass by all sorts of exotic and wonderful animals. I, I think it's one of the best jobs in the world because I get to share this adventure with my colleagues. So it's it's pretty special to have a, a, a employment like this. So I've been here uh, about 40 years now. So I was I was once a keeper in, in the marine mammal area. So I, I really loved working with the animals. Uh, so working with uh, the dolphins and the walrus were really great. But uh, you know, I, I learned I was a marine mammal snob. So I once I got out of, the, of my job and moved into all the other areas, every animal is so unique and interesting once you get to know them. And so that's been the greatest part of the last 20 years of my job is learning about all the various animals and, and their niche in the in the environment and what makes them special and important to to the world. And so that's really really cool. Over your time at the zoo, you've seen a lot of change in your position and your responsibilities. But even in these past few weeks, there's been an unprecedented amount of change. How has your job changed now? COVID is just one big change that we're all adapting to right now. Uh, this is, uh, there are no policies written. A lot of times we have a chance to con you know, predict things that are happening and then develop contingency plans for that. Uh, this is uh, no different than any other emergency that we've had them do, whether it's a blizzard or a flood or a tornado warning. Uh, we're using similar kind of uh, constructs to make sure that the animals are always at getting the highest level of care they can get, taking care of our staff, making sure they're safe. Uh, and the only equation, part of the equation that's missing now is our guests. Uh, uh, sometimes we do, we've closed the zoo a few times over our, uh, since 1934. But now we've been closed for you know almost two months, and so that has been the hardest thing to get used to. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we really have to focus on the animals and make sure that their care is as good or even better uh, than before the COVID epidemic. I want to talk a little bit about bringing the zoo to you and that whole initiative. Where did that idea come from? You know, our, our mission here at the zoo is to connect people with wildlife and nature. And whether that happens in person when they come here to the zoo, which two million plus people do every year, uh, we can still connect them via virtual experiences. The Zoo to You segments is just one more extension of that, where every day at 11 o'clock, we go and find a, a special animal. And the best thing is that we get our animal care staff to do most of these segments. I was really excited about the uh, African painted dog puppy uh, story yesterday. They got to be the cutest darn little kids around and they were just fascinated with uh, first of all being out in their enclosure and then getting uh, I guess I'll call it bones from heaven uh, yesterday when the bones were just kind of tossed in. They had no idea where they're coming from. There was uh, a half a second of uh, surprise and then like well this is great. I don't care where it came from. I love bones. I love meat and they just went around and played and showed all that complex social behavior that African painted dogs are known for. So how can people continue to support the zoo and the work that you're doing? Well, fantastic. Join us every 11, 11 o'clock every day, but it's very helpful for folks that still care about animals, still care about our planet and our mission. If they have the means to provide uh, anything to help us along during this time, uh, it's great. You can go to our, our website, of course, at czs.org or brookfieldzoo.org. And there are ways and in, in different amounts that you can pledge if you're, if you're willing to do so. Uh, the animals really need it and we really appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tim, and for telling us a little bit about the work that you're still doing. Oh, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Be sure to join us next week as we go a little bit more in depth and learn a little bit more about some of these animals. I'm Connor Seco. Make it a good morning, Illini. All those adorable animals hanging around with no one to admire them? Now that's a real tragedy. But if that didn't help brighten your mood, maybe U of I's very own acapella group might. Let's check out what they've been up to cooped up in their houses.
just sing, sing a song, sing a song. comes to a close, our seniors graduate and go forth into the world filled with uncertainty, saying goodbye to the warm and comfortable familiarity of the University of Illinois. With that in mind, let's check out how the marching Illini are keeping school pride alive and give our seniors one last chance to sing along to the heartfelt tune of Oski Wow Wow. I'm Dan Girardi. And I'm Maddie Rice. And for one last time for a while, make it a great day and good morning, good morning. Illini.